sometimes I'm doing first before I'm thinking. But it also has a great learning effect when you do mistakes. So I do both thinking first and sometimes doing first and thinking later. But it doesn't matter because we need to find solutions. We need to find solutions for the myriad of problems which we are facing in our world today. And this is a microcosm here in the Himalayan. In Nepal is further microcosm and the problems are not getting smaller. The problems are getting bigger the more you take a magnifying glass. And one of the points why we at PICRI like to work with the Himalayan consensus and with lawns is that we have the ability to look through the magnifying glass. And when we sponsor, we know that the money arrives without administrative costs immediately there where it needs to be. With this, I want to greet everybody, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Lance, Sujeev, thank you very much for having me here. I'm honored. I know some of you may think, oh, this is one of the major sponsors, and he bought himself the right to speak. Yeah, in a way, yes. Um, <laughs> there is some charm to it. But as we are a wholesale finance organization, there is no product placement I can make. So uh, don't worry about this. Uh, it will not happen. Um, I, want, I want to talk about three things. The first thing, um, why do we sponsor? Second thing, who the heck is Pigree? Because you may never come across them in your normal life. And you don't see ads of us in the television because we are wholesale. And third, and I think this is the most important thing, and the theme will be picked up by my co-founding colleague and friend Eckhart this afternoon, um, pre-funding, pre-disaster funding. So we talk twice about it because it's a very serious topic and it bears solutions, and there have been solutions uh, in the world. I give you some examples of this. Um, so why does Peak Re sponsor? For us, this is not a typical CSR charity thing where a, a financial organization is taking X percent of uh, the profits and putting it automatically into, into charity work every year. No, this is the result of thinking, thinking about what Himalayan consensus is, and it is certainly not a charity organization. Uh, the speeches this morning gave witness to it what it is. It is about the communities. It is about the sustainable development of the sustainable economic and social development of the communities we are living in and you are living in. And this bears a long-term profit, of course. But it's long-term. It cannot be measured by a quarterly outcome. It would be foolish to think that you can throw a profit out of this. That's why we don't put all of our money into it, only, only some, but we know it's well spent. So I want to start first with why is there an inner trust of peak re in the Himalayan consensus and the work Lawrence is doing. Lawrence and I, we, we are friends for a long period of time. I think we met the first time I was introduced to you in 98 when I came back to Asia and you helped me a lot at that time with a lot of lobbying work. But we spent a lot of evenings together and thinking how can we give back to the communities? How can we help the communities to not forget their roots? Because the problem is that when you have fast, rapid economic development, something is being unrooted. And when things are being unrooted, they cannot grow any longer. We need to have our roots to grow. And that's a very, very important thing. And so we had the first um, idea, you mentioned it before, was the mobile uh, clinic, MobiCare, for uh, nomads. And of course, it needs someone industrious like Lawrence to do this. And um, my former company, we sponsored him on this. I don't know how he convinced the People Liberation Army in China and better be, be careful, um, he convinced them to give him two Jeeps. 
I think these are quite old Jeeps, but they are still running, or oh, the last one has been just decommissioned recently. Uh, they were sprayed white. They were equipped with medical um, equipment, and uh, he had a doctor he knew, and the doctor took care of those two Jeeps. And the Jeeps were following the nomads and the development of the nomads, because the nomad would do the last thing to go into the big city, into this beautiful hospital, right? Or go into the school, put the kids in the school. They are nomads, and they want to stay nomads. So you need to follow them, and you need to help them, and you need to provide mobile care. And uh, then the story went on, and he learned with this. Uh, the doctor developed um, monks into paramedics because the nomads went for praying into the temple when, when they had stomach ache, right? They wouldn't go to the hospital. And the paramedic was there, and he could pick up that person after the prayers. There was also some medication given, and the nomad could go back to his family. The next thing we did, and he did, was making 6,000 people see again. Because you know, you are here from the Himalayan, and people in Tibet, they know uh, the sun is shining so strongly. If you don't have protection, you develop cataract very, very quickly. And it doesn't take much money to fix it again. And Lance took the initiative to invite a couple of people into his, um, into his Red Capital Club, it was called, or is called, in Beijing. And we did a, um, a sponsoring evening. And over two or three years' time, you made sure that 6,000 pair of eyes could see again. What a fantastic thing. You know your money you give is immediately being used for something positive. And the people are falling back into the economic cycle. They can work again. If they are blind, they're being pushed out of the society. They have nothing to do. They're sitting on the, on the sidewalk as, as uh, beggars. And the next thing was he grabbed me and he said, Franz, come on. Uh, the thing we discussed about Himalayan consensus, uh, this is huge. That is one ecosystem. We need to discuss it with the Chinese uh, Society of Social Science. And that was in 2000. And uh, both of us gave speeches to, he introduced the concept, and I only talked about natural catastrophes and what it does to the communities, because it's disrupting communities. And people who are so proudly owners of assets, houses, and have perhaps two or three generations being housed there, and it gives the foundation for earning for the next generation and so on, it's suddenly destroyed. And the whole family is falling back into poverty. So that was addressed there. And Lawrence took the Himalayan consensus idea, as we know it today, uh, into his hand and developed something very fantastic out of it. And I'm sure that when we stand here in five years' time, this initiative will grow. And it will grow very widely. And he makes it grow already, because he is spreading it all over the world. The last thing I want to report on, and we saw it yesterday, it's the rebuilding after earthquake. The communities need their temples. We could see that with our own eyes. Um, very, very clearly, these are not only spiritual places where the people go. These are social places where the people meet, where they get together day, day in, day out. And when the temple is being destroyed, there is something, as we would say in China, something terribly gone wrong with the feng shui. And you want to fix that again so that they can believe in the future again. So that's the first part. And that's why my colleagues in Pigree and I, we are completely convinced that this will bear fruits over time. And that's why we are a happy sponsor of the Himalayan consensus. Um, Pigree, perhaps a quick uh, word on us. Um, Pigri is a reinsurance company. Reinsurance companies are very often described as reinsurers of, uh, of, or insurers of the insurers. Um, it's not 100% correct, but we can do more than this. Yes, our clients are mainly the insurance industry. They come to us to get more capacity, and they want to get protection against natural catastrophe and other shock-like developments. But governments alike are buying reinsurance. 
there are possibilities to even structure reinsurance and bring the structures right away into the capital market and let the capital market pay for pre-disaster fun funding. The foundation idea of us and why we are in the middle of, um, of Asia is uh, we wanted to reach out to the emerging Asia. We found, I had a look and I, I have been in the reinsurance industry for very long and I have to blame myself for not having reached out to the community stronger um, because in 2008 I saw with the statistics that the insurance penetration and density, the protection of the people for their assets and, and for their health, for their lives, is falling behind those levels in Latin America and Africa. And knowing that Asia Pacific is the place where there is a higher frequency of natural catastrophe than anywhere else in the world. And this is the place where the insurance penetration is the lowest. I'm not talking about the normal insurance penetration of car insurance, but really asset insurance, health insurance, a real protection which protects you against shock-like development. And that's why we went on the street and we tried to get capital. And we got capital on the one hand side from a visionary organization in China. It's uh, the largest private uh, organization in China called Fusan. It's uh, situated in, um, in Shanghai. And their direction is creating a happy, healthy lifestyle and also by financial means. And that's why they invested in us. And um, the other investor at that time was uh, IFC, the World Bank, the investment arm of the World Bank. And there you see they looked at us as something different than the ordinary reinsurer because we promised that we will look after the communities over a long period of time of emerging, emerging Asia and the subcontinent. And here we are today. We started with a funding of 550 million US dollar. And by today, correct me if I'm wrong, Eckhart, I think uh, last time we counted, uh, shareholder value was standing over 1.1 billion US dollars. So you can make profits out of it. And I wouldn't stand here if you wouldn't make profits out of it. You can combine community work with profits. It is not a charity. That's most likely the most important thing. And last but not least, I want to introduce, and Eckhart will pick it up later, uh, pre-disaster funding. Uh, I take one example. I give, can give you thousands because it's our job to, to pay for losses after um, natural catastrophes. The natural catastrophe hitting in April 2015, Kathmandu, was a terrible one, and I, don't, I cannot talk about it, I didn't witness it. Madam, you witnessed it, and you talked about it before. Um, have such a disaster. What's happening next? Who is funding for the rebuilding? Government, rich people, foreign, uh, foreign governments. How do you organize getting the money in? How do you organize the support groups? Who is coming in first? Which flight are they taking? If you don't have a pre-disaster funding, you end up in a disarray, as we have seen so many times everywhere in the world. And here's the reinsurance industry, and we can do it. We can arrange pre-funding organizations for pre-disaster funds. And we can clearly describe if there is an earthquake happening with a strength of a stronger than 6.8 on the Richter scale, we know what the extent of dilemma is. We know more or less how many people will die. We know how many buildings will be destroyed. We know how much it costs to rebuild it because we do the research for it. So with a pre-funding arrangement, you have the funding ensured at the moment the disaster hits and you can start kicking loose your catastrophe plan. And everybody falls in place and gets started with their work because it's all pre-funded already. And it will create more funds because you can take that system from a small fund, a small initial fund, and you can spread it out and you can arrange each and every funding in the same, in the same way. Um, so the catastrophe plans are absolutely important. You should never have a pre-disaster uh, fund arrangement without the pre, uh, 
the catastrophe plan finalized. It will save ultimately the taxpayers' money. Uh, the 2015 earthquake, I don't know whether everybody is aware of how much that costs for GDP. It was 15% of the GDP of, uh, of Nepal. And that's a huge order. Uh, normally, natural catastrophes, for instance, in China, uh, they cost, on average, across uh, 10 years, about 8% of the GDP. And that's what's happening when you do not have sufficient protection there. China, over the last 20 years, has learned a lot and has introduced a lot of protections, but we are still far away from where we need to go. And that's most likely everywhere in the world. When Sandy hit New York, 90% was funded. When uh, Haiyan, the typhoon, the strongest typhoon ever, hit the Philippines, 5% was funded. Here, from that, you can imagine how big the suffering is and how tough it is to rebuild the communities and to rebuild what once was a very intact community which was signified by its members who were all middle-class society members. And suddenly, you're finding communities which are all living in poverty and don't know how their future is. With this, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you. Thank you very much.